stand up and then people just walk out. But I'm used to it. Please don't go, Gabe. Please don't go. Join me. 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Last Sunday we were here for a little while in this particular passage. But we're going to teach through it a little bit more. Of course, last Sunday, what a beautiful time. Extra special, of course. It's the first day of the week every Sunday, and as I often say, we celebrate the resurrection all the time, but it really was the Passover time of the old, and of course, to the new covenant of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ on the first day of the week, and the beautiful music, the singing, of course, all of you uh, that were able to partake. Uh, If you haven't been able to, uh, it's up on uh, YouTube and our First Bible ADP, of course, it's on Facebook. Uh, after Facebook Live, it say, keeps the recording, but I, I've, I've already listened to it an extra time and started some more listening, and the music's beautiful, the sound quality is excellent, the team that worked to make sure that all was done well points to giving edification to all of you and to give glory to God, and that's, that's what we desire to do. And uh, the more excellent way is that... Uh, We do it because of the love of Christ, and we do it because, as it says up on the screen, God's love, love never fails. His uh, love, charity never faileth. That's the theme of our our study as we are in chapter number 15, and uh, yeah, we're, we're heading home on our study. We are getting close to finishing up. We'll finish up, come into the family conference, which is the first part of May, and then we'll have a new study I've been uh, sitting on, praying on, studying on for a while, and uh, I'll tell you it's going to be the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke for a while, since there's uh, 24 chapters in that, and that's eight more chapters than this, it might take three years, but we'll see how it goes, we're just going to look at what God has to say to us, Jesus is fashioned as the Son of Man, in Luke's Gospel from Dr. Luke. And so I'm looking forward to that as we look at the idea of declare hope over the next year or so in Christ alone. So we're going to finish up 1 Corinthians really strong. There's a lot here. We're going to cover um, 34 verses. We're not going to read them all in the beginning like sometimes we do. I'm going to take it at four different chunks and and make some application here. But there's some really, really good stuff here. Um, And so very thankful again for Resurrection Sunday. Last week, love the songs, of course, that were chosen today by your worship pastor. I mention him often in that regard, that he spends time intentionally and prayerfully to make sure that we're headed in the right direction, of course, speaking about his resurrection and continuing that way. That's a, that's a good way to go, and I, I'm thankful. And again, as, as we are in 1 Corinthians 15, you think of just really looking at the first three verses, four verses, and you see the gospel there, and you're reminded that uh, Paul's here to deliver the gospel, and we are here to deliver the gospel, and last week we did so by having a gospel message of 15 minutes and and giving people an opportunity to respond. Also, those that are believers, a chance to respond in terms of, hey, maybe this is the start of the rest of my life in the Lord where I will live in the gospel on a daily basis. The word gospel means good news. And Paul is conveying the good news to the church at Corinth over again and over again because they've lost track. And as we see here in these 30-something verses this morning, we'll find out that again, uh, Paul is headed into the place of cleaning up some doctrinal issues. Uh, As it says up on the screen there in our first, very first slide, chapter 15 is devoted entirely to the discussion of doctrine primarily the resurrection, and we know it is the most in-depth study of this extremely important doctrine in all of the Word of God. The resurrection is mentioned in the Old Testament. There is prophecy of Christ's coming, of being resurrected, uh, excuse me, of being the, the, the lamb that was slain, uh, but also, too, that he was raised from the dead. Jesus himself spoke of his own resurrection. The importance of the resurrection is incredible, Uh, And we know it has to be. We hang so much on there as the the key doctrine to the believer. And uh, I want you to just 
get some doctrine, uh, excuse me, get some background so how this doctrine got messed up. If you remember in uh, Acts 17 when, when Paul was preaching to the people at Athens, of course, they're Grecian people as well, some even laughed at him when he spoke of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Um, even if you want to flip over there real quick, Acts chapter number 17, of course, with your digital Bibles, uh, you can go even faster than me, but uh, when he's preaching in Athens, the Grecian people, it says in verse 32 of Acts 17, and when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear this, hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. The bottom line is the Grecian people did not believe in the resurrection. The Greek philosophers believe that the body was a place of bondage, a vessel of bondage, that once you're dead, you're freed from this awful body. So consider these redeemed, converted, new creatures in Christ, Gentile, Corinthian people that have a Grecian background that they've been taught that, hey, by the philosophers, this body is a place of bondage, and when it's dead, it's dead, and it's done... I know we don't even believe in any kind of resurrection, as Paul was even talking about Christ's resurrection. They mocked him and laughed at him. It's interesting that we, as we read the Bible, don't get some background and get some understanding of the context of the people and some of the historical. And so we don't, why in the world would they do this? Or why are they having such a tough time with this? Because of their upbringing. Some of you have been taught maybe in your religious setting of things that have been a conflict that are not biblical. I have for years had to walk through some of the things that I was taught in the religion that I grew up in. And to have them undone by the word of God, by the doctrine. These people, he's speaking to the church, they're born again, they've been redeemed, they've been taught. But now they've reverted back to some of their old ways of thinking in their carnal state. What if the resurrection of Jesus Christ did not occur? We spoke of this last week and brought these verses into play in our message because then there would be hopelessness. As it says there, and if Christ be not raised, back in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse number uh, 17, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are all men, of all men, most miserable. Remember, if the resurrection is not real, if it is not true, and Paul's approach is, hey, if this is what you're thinking, and in my text that I'm giving you, in the letter that I'm writing to you, hey, my approach to you is, what if it didn't happen? <laughs> then everything is a mess. If really what you're saying and your false teaching and your false preaching is true and I am wrong and what I have witnessed on the road to Damascus and the, seeing the, uh, the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ embodied right there. If you're telling me and all those apostles and all those witnesses that it is false, then we are miserable, most miserable. It's the focal point, you know, of our Christianity. Jesus Christ spoke of the resurrection himself and of course john's gospel one of the i am statements right up on the screen jesus said unto her i am the resurrection and the life he that believeth in me though he were dead yet shall he live and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die powerful statement of jesus christ himself don't forget, he says, and he continued even in verse number 26, he asked a question, believest thou this? Jesus is declarative by himself, even, strong, even more strong, has us at a place where when we finally believe in what he has done for us, all those difficulties go away. So again, believers in the church, how is it that this could happen to the church at Corinth? Well, it could happen to any of us believers if we fall away from the word of God and we return back to the carnal state of religiousness. And Paul is stating very simply, you all need to get a grip on the truth of the doctrine and get more solid in what 
Jesus Christ did for you because the question comes back to you and me just like Jesus put it before his audience. Do you believe what Jesus Christ, What do you believe what I'm saying about myself? You recall and are reminded of Romans chapter number 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God had raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's Paul saying it to the people of Rome, the church, the lost, the Jew, the Gentile, in that setting there in Rome. He's saying, look it, you need to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth to be saved. Because the work has been done, but it can be sitting there forever. You can say, I believe in the resurrection, but you've never believed personally on what it can do to save your soul. As a born-again believer, that was one of the key pieces of Scripture that struck me. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not in a methodical way. Just say another prayer away, because I said prayers from the time that I could speak. But with a true belief in the resurrection and a salvation that's going to come to me by grace through faith, if I would just say, it's in you, Jesus Christ, and you alone. But if that resurrection did not happen, then we have a mess on our hands. Let me put this quote up on the screen for you. If there is no resurrection, then Christ was not raised. If he was not raised, there is no gospel to preach. If there is no gospel, there's no good news, then you have believed in vain and you are still in your sins. If there is no resurrection, then believers who have died have no hope. We shall never see them again. From Warren Wearsby. Consider that quote. Consider that profound statement if... The gospel news of Jesus Christ, the good news, is not true. Then everything, everything that we believe in is void. It is vanity. Without hope, there are people that are like that. Without belief in Christ, there are people like that. Without life eternal, that's what our message was very simply last week. It's the gospel. You, if you would open up the scripture, if you would have someone open up the scripture for you, if you're lost and you have never believed in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone to save your soul, then life will become a place of meaninglessness. Have we forgotten what a meaningless, wasteful life really looks like for the lost? You see, that's Paul's approach here. You are saved. You are born again. You're reading this letter in the early church. Now we're reading it 2,000 years later, and you're going, well, what's the problem here? The same problem as it is today was then 2,000 years ago, that many, many believers are living like the resurrection didn't happen, and they've lost the life in their living, and they've lost the living in their life And they don't have the motivation of what Jesus Christ did to raise from the dead to give you new life. The other side is that the believers are walking around with people surrounding them. They're all around them that need to understand what it means to have hope and belief in Christ so that they can have life eternal and a life today that is full of purpose. The same message today is the same message years ago. And I often say when we study the Bible and read the letters that Paul has written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, we are the beneficiaries of not being in the real time of saying, oh, gosh, I can learn a lesson from that. I can learn a lesson from this. I can learn a lesson from that. Well, let's learn some lessons this morning. Because in the end, I do not want it to be that life is meaningless. And it's not, in Jesus Christ, it's not, but for so many people in the end, because they don't believe in the resurrection, because there's preaching against the resurrection, because they're stuck in cultish type of religious gatherings that believe that Jesus Christ was not truly divinity, that he was definitely not the son of God, but just happened to be a son of God.
then life at the end will be meaningless. It may be meaningless now, but in the end, the life that that person who has never, ever trusted in and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the raised from the dead Savior for eternal life, has never called upon the name of the Lord, has never trusted and received by believing in the heart, life is meaningless. It's all meaningless in the end without Christ and without the resurrection. That's what Paul is conveying today. So in our lesson, in our teaching, in our things that are going to come across, maybe you'll ask the Lord, Lord, first of all for me, am I truly in the place of being born again? I know that I'm saved. I, and I, I believe in the resurrection. I've called out to the Lord to save me. And I know it was for by grace that I'm saved through faith and not of myself. It's the gift of you, God. There's no works that I could do because then I'd boast in them as the scripture says. Okay, then what am I doing with the resurrection and the good news to other people? There was countless people on the fields of ADP Sports Park yesterday. So many would say, I go to church, I've been baptized, I believe in Jesus. And, but is that then a place for them to say, okay, fine. Let's just keep on carrying on. No, it's every week telling them the good news. Every week letting them know what life in Jesus Christ means. Letting every little child and every little parent and every little grandpa and grandma hear the words. But see them in our actions as well and say, this is not meaningless vanity and vexation of spirit. For you 331 children, it is everything for us to give you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and teach you a little bit of soccer along the way and have you understand how much Jesus means to us. It's not meaningless. You live a life in Christ and you let other people know about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the way, the truth, and the life that no man can come to the Father but by him. Oh my, there's other meaningless life living people that are going to grasp it and go, I don't want to live a meaningless life. And Paul is conveying that to the church at Corinth. If you sit in a place where you say that this resurrection is a waste of time, that it really didn't happen, then you are conveying an awful message to people. And you are going to ruin their spirit. And you're going to ruin their chance of having a meaningful life and having life eternal in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to go through this, as I said, in four different pieces. So let's grab the first 11 verses of chapter number 15 after our little introduction there. Follow along with me. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein ye stand. That says everything right there. I've been there, I've preached it, you've believed in it, and you stand in it. Here I am declaring it again to you. Verse number two. By which also ye are saved. You're saved by that gospel. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Did you believe in an emptiness and a nothingness? Did you believe in a vanity of mind? Did you believe in a worthless way? No, you believed true unless you, unless you did. Say, ah, oh, let me just give you some lip service, God. No. He's saying, hey, this is how you got saved, by believing in the gospel and rejecting all of the beliefs. Verse 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I had also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Listen to this evidence. Verse 5. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And after, after that he was seen of about, above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep, which means at the time of the writing of the letter, that's what he's speaking of. Some are still around, some have fallen asleep, which means died. Verse number seven, after that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. 
And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Powerful statement Paul is making of himself because that was spoken of by him, of him being that Jew that was born out of due time to go to the, to the Gentiles to bring the gospel. Verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or there, they, so we preach and so we believe. Very simply, that's Paul's testimony. And he gives it so many different times. He says it at the beginning of Romans. He says it at the beginning of many of his letters. Of course, of Timothy, he speaks of himself and just being overwhelmed by God's grace to save his soul. You see, you and I right now looking at this simple reading in the first, first 11 verses, you go, wow, I got this. I get it. As a believer in Jesus Christ, sure. He was seen. His resurrection is real. There's a historical account in the old manuscripts of historical accounts that Jesus Christ did raised from the dead. And he was seen by hundreds and hundreds of people. And it's accounted not just in scripture only, but in historical books. But see, in the end, those that live life and don't believe this, they end up in a meaningless place. They, and they end up living in a place where, wow, it really didn't matter life for them. You see, people who have not believed the facts of Jesus' resurrection are living an empty life of purposelessness. They're living a life that is empty. Now let me just give some context to this. Just working through this and, and praying through this over the last few hours, I knew this was what was on, but I, I don't know, just, God just finally gave, gave me some light in this as I'm reading it. There are some people that intentionally have not believed the facts of Jesus' resurrection and have been more belligerent maybe about it. Like, I don't believe in that Jesus stuff at all. I don't believe in that God stuff at all. And you just get it out of my face. I'll never believe. I'm an atheist. I, I just, I don't believe. Okay, okay, okay. okay. That's fine. That's cool. Then there's some that have heard a little bit, but they haven't heard enough. So they don't believe yet because they haven't had enough evidence. They just haven't got enough proof. And that's fine. And then there are those to me that I have met over the years that have not believed the facts of Jesus' resurrection because they just haven't had it explained and shown to them yet. They've heard some things, maybe they've seen some things, they know that the heavens declare the glory of God, they look around in this creation and go, there must be a God, there must be a way of being redeemed, there must be a way because as a sinful man, I can't be in the presence of God, there's no way that God would let me be in his presence, how in the world could I be? I'm dirty, I'm, I'm undone, I, 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 there's no way, God, how do I come to know you? I'm going to trust you by faith. Please bestow grace upon me and save my soul. There are people that maybe have never believed the facts of the resurrection because they need you to show them the Bible. They need to show, I'm just talking about those here in America. Let's not go off, of, well, what about the people in northern Greenland? They're freezing. I don't know. But you have influence on the people in your life. How is it that we always want to give the metaphor or thought or extreme example to get us off the hook? Paul's not getting the Corinthian people off the hook because he's talking to the Corinthian people at Corinth, a Grecian city. Very busy. 
lots of people coming in and out. And he's saying, you as believers, how is it that you act now like you don't believe the facts? How is it that the preaching and teaching that's going on in your church setting is negating and rejecting? Think of what it says there. The gospel is basically outlined in verses 3 and 4. If you keep in memory what has happened there, then you're saying, hey, this is verse number 2, that hey, look, keep in memory. Have you lost your memory, your, your marbles? I was just there a few years ago, and I spent 18 months with you preaching it. That's how you got saved. Jesus was seen by witness after witness after witness after witness. So yes, there are some unbelievers that are very intentional about not believing, but there are some that just, they're not intentional about not believing so very deeply. They just need to hear it. And if they reject it, sure. But a lot of times people just don't. I, I never really have heard the complete truth and facts of this good news. You say we're in the United States of America, everybody has a Bible, don't you dare believe that. And if they have a Bible, they may never have read it and they wouldn't even know where to start. And how is it that you and I act like we don't believe what we've believed on? Because there are people that are out there with some, some, some bad experiences that come into play in relationally with religion, with God, with Jesus and the words of Jesus. Maybe they've never been in the church. Maybe it's their age, they're too young. Maybe it's just the fact that they have a, a, an incredible educational background and they never really have dug into some of these things. Maybe it's something to do with their current relationships and they're in a relationship with someone who draws them away to think against the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Very simply, Paul is expressing in these first 11 verses how much he's thankful for God sending his son Jesus and Jesus meeting him on the road to Damascus and his grace in verse number 10, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. It wasn't a waste of time. It wasn't worthless. And now I have a purpose-filled life, not an empty life of purposelessness. Very simply, in the end, life is meaningless for those people that have not believed in the facts of the resurrection. They're empty. And by the way, I knew the facts of the resurrection, but I really never, ever, ever thought I had to do anything with it because I was told that, hey, it's up to God, take a chance, everything might work out, everything might not work out, but if it doesn't, or if it does, oh my, I, somebody opened up the Bible and showed me things, and to this day, I can't be more thankful for someone saying, I gotta tell this person how to believe to have eternal life. The second piece of our lesson comes from verses 12 through 19. Follow along with me. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, Christ preached it himself. We read it earlier out of John chapter number 11 as one place. We'll read a couple others. How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Christ himself spoke it. Verse 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? So really simply he's saying this. There's a resurrection from the dead for all people. Then Christ, because Christ has taught that. So then you say, well, wait a minute, what about Christ's resurrection? Because Christ said that there's a resurrection from the dead of all people. Got it? Okay. Then we have the Christ's resurrection. So really, he's bringing both pieces of doctrine in. Verse number 14, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain, and your faith is vain. You have basically put your faith in something that's worthless and empty. That's what he's saying to the people. This is where you we're living here. This is where we're, this is, I, I was with you guys 18 months. Verse 15. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. We're telling lies. Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. If all of this is wrong, and as he's giving his testimony and his accounting, he's saying to them, hey, if this is where you're going to live, this is, we're a, we have a mess on our hands. Verse 16, if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Whew. 
you're still stuck in your sins without the resurrection because it's an incomplete redemption. It's just a blood sacrifice in the Old Testament. It's not the perfect. It's the propitiation. It's the new life in Christ. It's Christ being risen. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. It's empty. It's void. Ye are yet in your sins. And you know those sins can't enter the presence of God. Well, I'll give it a try. I'll give it a shot. Maybe I've done enough good to offset the bad. That's not what the Bible says. That's what man's religion does to send people to hell. You say, should I blame those people? No. It's the prince of the power of this air that has conveniently worked on the people of this world over centuries to bring a distorted message against Jesus Christ. He did it in the wilderness to Jesus. He said, Jesus, if you just bow to me, you can have everything. You're hungry, why don't you just turn those stones into bread? He tempted the God of the universe, the Son of God and the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, to release his deity and release the will of the Father and abdicate the responsibility of living, dying, being buried, and raising from the dead on the third day. He's been at it for centuries. And you think that he didn't want to mess with the church at Corinth or mess with the church at First Bible on Adams Dairy Parkway? You're crazy. All he'd love for us to do is flip our doctrine. He'd love for us to start teaching something different. He'd love for us to teach a works-based religious form of salvation and not in Jesus Christ alone. Think of what it says in verse number 18. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are, of all men, most miserable. Oh, those verses, you know, they're tough. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Powerful, powerful, powerful. We'll get there in a minute. See, people who preach that Jesus' resurrection never happened have put people in a condition of bad consequences. They really have. They really have. This religion believes this about Jesus. Jesus is not God. Before he lived on earth, he was Michael the archangel. Jehovah made him the universe through, excuse me, made the universe through him. On earth, he was a man who lived a perfect life after dying on a stake, not a cross. He was resurrected as a spirit. His body was destroyed. Jesus is not coming again. He returned vis invisibly in 1914 in spirit. Very soon, he and the angels will destroy all non-Jehovah witnesses. I don't read that disrespectfully. I say to you that there is teaching and preaching contrary. That's what Paul is saying right here. Verse 12 sets out, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? There's contrary preaching and teaching. So we're the false witnesses and they're right. You see, this is an important thing to consider right here. There's other religions that say, hey, Jesus is a separate God from the Father, Elohim. He was created as a spirit child by the Father and Mother in heaven and is the elder brother of all men and spirit beings, including Lucifer. His body was created through sexual union between Elohim and Mary, another religion that teaches that. That's the Mormonism religion. So when it comes to the resurrection, it's just a God with a little G, and he died and he didn't raise from the dead because they don't believe it. What did the Sadducees believe? No resurrection. No resurrection. It's the same thing. Look, when you look there and just stare at that for a moment, consider the consequences of the ones who preach this. Because they're setting people up. 
there is people put in the condition of bad consequences because of the preaching of this untruth. Consequences are the ones who preach, not the resurrection. Are telling against the people that do believe in the resurrection that it's all vanity. It is worthless. It's futile. Think of what it says there. Verse 14. If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? Faith vain? Empty? Nothing? That's a bad consequence. That really is a really bad consequence. Think of verse number 14 again. Excuse me, I already said preaching in vain and faith in vain. I meant to go to the next verse, verse 15. And we are found false witnesses. Again, people that preach that Jesus' resurrection never happened are now bringing to the fore these really bad consequences of how people look at life in Christ, whether it can be real or not. Why are we not letting people know the truth of the Word of God by showing them the Word of God? Not your opinion, but saying, may I show you what the Bible says? May I show you that there were people back 2,000 years ago in churches that were churches that started out with the gospel and had things solid and had things right, but yet, contrary-wise, as time went on, they changed doctrine Paul himself was so solid on this doctrine of truth. He believed in it so much. Romans chapter number 1, verses number 1 through 4. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his uh, prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Romans 1, first four verses talk about the prophecy of Jesus coming according to the scripture, of being in the seed of data according to the flesh, of being born physically, dying physically, and being raised from the dead physically. That's the truth. If this preaching goes on and people believe it, they're in a condition of bad consequences because they're still in their sins. Verse number 17, you're yet in your sins, which means they're believing in a religion and a cultish thinking that denies and rejects the thought that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and that he's God. Then what happens? Those that believe it and are already dead, they're perished. Think of all the people that have gone before you that have died and gone to hell because they believe this false teaching that Jesus did not raise from the dead, that there is no resurrection. And those from this moment on that perish, that don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they perish. What are we doing about it, believers? Because in verse number 19, that phrase that strikes me, as you know, Very hard. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, that he just, that he didn't raise from the dead, he was a good man, we are of all men most miserable. Without the resurrection, we have no Savior. We have no salvation. We have no forgiveness. We have no meaning, no purpose, no life worth living. In the end, meaninglessness. Verses number 20 down through verses 28 but now is christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept verse number 21 for since by man came death by man came also the resurrection of the dead for as in adam all die even so in christ shall all be made alive but every man in his own order christ the first fruits afterward they that are christ at his coming Woo! yeah okay so those that are alive boom when Christ comes, boom, whoo, first fruits. For those that are already gone, okay, you're already in the presence of the Lord. Verse number 24. Then come at the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and all power, and he must, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies 
under his feet, which simply means people bowing to the feet of Jesus Christ. Verse number 26 down through 28. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, it says in the book of Revelation. Verse number 27. For he that hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day. And verse number 28 says, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. The subjection. Jesus at the right hand, the God of the universe on the throne. He's in subjection to him, but yet he is God. The Holy Spirit now. All three in eternity. And all believers in his presence. On the other side of it, though, people who forsake Jesus' resurrection for redemption are bound for the resurrection of damnation. Did I make that up? I did not. It's in the Bible. Go to John 5 real quick. John 5. Again, what does it say up there? It says, people who forsake Jesus' resurrection for redemption. This is about the order and how things lay out for the resurrection. For the Redeemer to carry things out. Christ risen from the dead. The redeemed when they believe in him. But every man in his own order. Christ the first fruits. And then of course in verses 24 through 28. He's going to put everything together. And it's the restoration of his kingdom. Everything's right there when it comes to the Redeemer Jesus, the redeemed who we are when we believe in him, and then the restoration of his kingdom one day. That's it. What a beautiful passage of scripture. But those that forsake it, they're bound for the resurrection of damnation. What do you mean? Remember, all people are resurrected. They don't just stay in the dirt. There's one, and then there's another. There's two. Let's see what Jesus taught. John chapter number 5, verse number 28. The Jews have been criticizing him, talking at him, rejecting him, picking at everything he's teaching. It says in verse number 28, Marvel not at this. Marvel not at what? The verse number 26 and 7, for as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Judgment's going to come on the cross, which explains how Jesus is saying, I didn't come to judge that, I'm judging sin. You, one day, will be judged by holy God, and I will be at his right hand. That's what Jesus is teaching. So don't marvel so much. Because this is all going to come to fruition one day. By Jesus' own words. For the hour is coming in the which. Verse 28. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice. And shall come forth. It says all that are in the graves. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Jesus is bearing witness of his Father in heaven and saying, through me, He's saying what he's going to say at the end of his life to the apostles when he says, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. He's already speaking of it early in his ministry. And he is saying, look, people, if you forsake my resurrection one day, that redemption that you will have, you're going to have a resurrection of damnation. 
instead of a resurrection of life. Who is the resurrection and the life? That was one of the opening verses we read, which of course is in John 11, 11, 25. It all comes together. Jesus spoke of it all. Clearly, clearly, Jesus wants this message to come across in his ministry. Paul wants it to come across in his ministry to the Corinthians. As we finish up, here's our last one in the last few verses. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. I'll finish up with you in verses 29 through 34. Five verses, six verses. Why are the dead raised up? Else, verse number 29, what shall they do with which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? Very simply, at first that sounds so very, very confusing. What is that? And it can be at first. But... There are some religions, a religion I know for sure, that baptize people for the dead. But baptism does not save you. And save the person, dead or living. Baptism isn't for salvation. But yet, Paul is speaking of something that is being falsely taught. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all why are they then baptized for the dead why are you even considering that that has anything to do with salvation verse 30 and why stand we in jeopardy every hour why i protest by your rejoicing which i have in christ jesus our lord i die daily if after the manner of men i have fought with beasts at ephesus what advantage it me if the dead rise not. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Why? If, if there's no resurrection in Jesus Christ, then why am I fighting for the resurrection of the Jesus Christ and that doctrine? Why, why am I wasting? Why, if you could baptize some for someone who's already died so they can be raised into heaven, then why am I preaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ and believing in that? I, I'm wasting my time, Paul's saying. I'd fight the beasts of Ephesus. Why would I go to the fight? And some say that's him just fighting against the Jews that wanted to take him out. Why do I fight for what's right, Paul's saying, if it's not true? Paul's pretty passionate. He says in verse number 33, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Going back to the false teaching, the false preaching. That verse is pulled out of context. Oftentimes, I'll see you said bad things. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt bad man, corrupt good manners. The manner by which you live according to the resurrection, when you have evil communications, people that are teaching evil communications about the resurrection, it corrupts what is good and what is right. Simple passage. So it's not complicated. Simple. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Goes back to what I started out with. People just don't know sometimes. They just don't know the truth of the resurrection. They don't know that they believe in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection and the good news of the gospel. They don't know that they need to reject all their belief system of how that they would have eternal life. How that they would have their sins forgiven. I need to do a bunch of stuff in order to find God's great grace. When he says it's unmerited favor, it is my grace that is sufficient for thee. It is my grace that saves you. For by grace are you saved through faith. And Paul is saying again, I speak to your shame. Because some have not the knowledge of God. People who ignore the power of Jesus' resurrection simply define their morality of meaninglessness. There's a morality here. What do you mean? It's just a way of life. Contrary to the way of life and your moral thinking that Jesus is raised from the dead. Jesus' resurrection ought to formulate, believer, your thinking process your morality, your life. Why would you live a good, strong, moral life and not believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ so that you could earn your way 
into heaven. That's, that's vanity. But Paul is saying very simply this. What I'm teaching you people is the truth of the word of God. I speak this to your shame. And I'm telling you this. If people could be baptized for the dead, the dead, <laughs> why would we hold on to that? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. Very simply is this. 500 people saw. <laughs> Five people witnessed, over 500 people witnessed it. And Paul saying, hey, why are you protesting against this? Jesus is risen. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus. <laughs> I'm not in any way, shape, or form going to entertain the possibility that Jesus Christ is not risen when he was seen by so many. Oh, I die daily to him. I die daily to his resurrection because I'm going to be raised in the resurrection of life, not the resurrection of damnation. I live a meaningful life, not a meaningless life. My morality is centered up on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This resurrection, again, determines my morality compass. It determines how I set, which direction I go, and how I handle things according to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and according to the salvation that God has given me. There are moral implications when there's no resurrection because people that don't believe in the resurrection, they live an immoral or unmoral life. They live a neutral life where they're not committed one way or the other. Or they live an anti-God, anti-good morals life. And it's meaningless at the end. Very simply as we conclude in our prayer time. Most miserable. That phrase, again, just can't get off of me. And maybe I just won't let it. If all I have is Christ lived and he never raised from the dead, then I'm going to be a miserable person at the day of judgment. But I'm not going to be because of the truth and the facts. Jesus is risen from the dead. And we believe in a risen Savior. But they're unbelievers. The lost. They are without hope in Christ. And maybe today, for just a couple minutes, we would take some time to pray for them. Pray for those that you know. Let us pray for those that we know that have not believed in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ.